So what we found is that by giving people, by giving everybody their own um, interface into this world, pairing didn't happen naturally. Uh, and what tended to happen was what we call twin and triplet programming. And people would, people still wanted to collaborate, so they would tend to, quite naturally you would collaborate with the person sitting next to you or the people sitting on either side of you a lot of the time because that physical world is still um, very much there. Um, but people would pair up into twos or threes. They'd be working on the same task, much like pairing, but they would be able to flip roles. So one might be coding, one might be looking at a test, someone's going off and looking something up, someone else starts, and that fluidity of changing means th that people can flip those roles in between. And this seemed to happen naturally. It wasn't like we told people to group together. That was just how the behavior worked. Um, yeah, I talk about the group communication later. Um, so, okay, transparency. Uh, transparency was this idea that you can see what other people are doing. Uh, you're aware of their status. Um, uh, and I get that's team transparency, I guess. So Kent Back talks about uh, individual transparency, which is, um, comes from things like test-driven development, for example, where you are uh, exposing um, your, um, your intentions in the code and the, whether it's working or not by writing these tests first. And then about team transparency, where um, you are aware of what everyone else on the team is doing. Um, and as we deploy applications faster, as they get more complex, um, as our requirements are changing, there's more and more need to know the status of what everyone is doing, uh, or at least how the project is going at any point in time. So whereas you, know, you might have once had weekly status meetings, now you have daily status meetings. And as that progresses, you start to have more and more and more need for real-time status to the point that maybe it's a good idea that your tools start just exposing that information rather than getting together and talking about what you're doing. Um, so we haven't actually implemented this yet, but we saw a need for it very quickly in, in the earliest workshops, um, is this idea of what we call heat and scent, um, which is basically we think of heat as an indication that someone has been in this area recently. So you know, it may be as simple as just there's a slight glow to it that fades over time or something like, like that. So if you come into a method, you can sense, well, okay, someone has been someone has been editing this code, or even someone has been looking at this code. This is an area where people have been. Um, and this idea of scent, which is more like uh, a trail of what people have been doing, so that you can see, um, you know, you can probably even click on someone and follow their process progress through the code. You can replay it. You can look at what they were doing in what order, who's changed what. Um, continuous testing. Uh, if anyone's seen anything about JUnit Max, this is very much what this is trying to do. Um, it became clear very quickly that in a system like this where you have, say, eight people changing your code, you not only can the code change at any point, but the test can change at any point. So you might make a change, run the test, and they fail, but did they fail because you changed the code or because someone else changed the code or because they changed the tests? Um, and you don't really know. So there's this need to have the tests basically looping, just running constantly. Um, you can run them in the background, and there's sort of a real-time status notification, are they passing, are they not passing? Um, and then combined with that heat and send information, you'd then be able to say, well, uh, you can look at what methods the test runs through. You can say, well, it ran through that method. John changed that method three seconds ago. OK, there's a good chance that that method is now failing because John changed that method. And so you can start to use that information to cue you know, someone to say, well, OK, that's something that you need to look at because you just broke it. Um, and there's a lot of stuff you can do then with that contextual information. And so this is the kind of stuff I'm talking about, presence, where the virtual world is your code and not a 3D space. Um, coming out of that was this interesting idea that um, you know, Agile talks about not owning code. And in this model, we found that really nobody could own the code because you, could, you might change a method and then someone else was in there changing it the next minute. Um, and so wolves don't, and obviously individual wolves don't have any concept of ownership. Everything is in terms of the pack. Um, but even then, there's this idea that, I mean, the pack doesn't own a territory. They, they defend a territory. If they're walking the territory and hunting in it, the other wolf packs are going to keep away. If they abandon it, someone else is going to sweep in. So I have this lovely image of you know, a, a huge 
team, a huge uh, department with all these different Wolfpack teams, and you know, you've, you've neglected the networking code for a while, so this other Wolfpack swoops in and says, yeah, okay, I'm gonna hunt in that territory now, and you, know, you kind of lose it just by, um, by virtue of having not worked it properly. Um, another thing that we noticed was uh, the idea of an open channel, and this is, so when we were running the workshops, we had everybody sitting around a table, basically. Um, and one of the experiments we still want to do is to try it as a distributed um, team. But one of the things we've noticed is that this open channel seems to be very critical. And it's sort of akin to a, um, a dinner conversation, perhaps. So you have this, you know, you're, you might be talking with someone next to you, but you can sort of hear what's going on in the rest of the group. And so um, you can join in, you know, a topic comes up, everyone can join in, and you can have a group discussion, and then you can go back to what you're doing. Um, it's very similar to the open workspace concept, of course, but it's, it's much closer. And I think because the team is all working on the same task, um, there is much more opportunity for that to be a common discussion, as opposed to an open workspace where, you know, you can hear what other people are doing, but probably they're working on something that's not as closely related to what you're doing. Um, and one of the one of the interesting things we noticed here, actually, was we've done one or two workshops in rooms with just terrible acoustics, um, just loud echo, uh, noise, and you know you could barely hear uh, someone on the other side of the table. And we might have had two or three groups going. And in those cases, the groups have all really struggled to gel as a team, to collaborate, to complete the task, um, just because the acoustics in that room were not as good as in the other cases. So. Uh, you know, I do think that this can work in a distributed environment, but clearly replicating that idea of this open channel uh, in some way is quite important. And you know, we wonder, for example, whether you need this idea of, with your presence in the code, that maybe you even hear the conversations of people who are near you in the code. Um, if someone's working on a, a similar, you know, how you define near is, of course, the interesting uh, question, but um, whether you need that virtual um, contextual audio of louder sound for people who are closer, that kind of thing. Um, OK, and then finally, flow. Um, flow is the idea that you can, you can switch easily from one task to another. Um, and this is something that Agile pushes quite hard on. Um, and the, but the, the sort of follow on from that is the more that you change modes, the more transitions you have. So, Continuous integration is great at um, speeding up the development and the, um, or the, sorry, the building and the testing and so on, so that you can do that more often, but look at all the transitions here, right? Arrows, 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 arrows. So you, if you don't have a process or an environment that lets you make those transitions very quickly, you're building a huge overhead um, of time that is going to slow you down the more you make those transitions. Um, so. This is just you know, a, a rough representation of a continuous integration process. And um, we, by having everybody working in the same environment all the time, we've, we essentially remove this idea that you need to commit off and build and integrate and merge and update and all that kind of stuff. And committing really just becomes checkpointing. Um, every time you save a method, you are integrated. Um, you make a change, you save it, the tests are running constantly. So we've taken a whole bunch of those transitions out. Um, we also, because everyone has their own entry into the environment and can swap roles and jump around very quickly, we've essentially brought all this stuff closer, I think, so that the transitions, when we see some of the groups have done that have succeeded much better at this than others, but the ones that have worked really, really well when they get going, um, they're you know, bouncing ideas, stuff's flying, I need this method, someone else has already implemented it, and it, it's, you can almost just sense it bouncing around the table, it's quite impressive. Um, and so when it's working well anyway, um, you basically get rid of those transitions. So um, I'd, I encourage you to think about collaboration, how your teams collaborate, and how the environment, um, uh, how the, your tools are allowing you to collaborate and think about you know, what you need to get your teams collaborating more closely together at a different level. Um, and I'm pretty excited about the stuff I'm seeing. I don't know where it's going to go yet, but um, the workshops are a lot of fun. And hopefully, in the near future, your teams will look more like those teams. <laughs>
Well, and it took uh, quite a bit of time from you. Yep. So if Francis doesn't mind, we're going to pull a couple of it from you and give a little of time for questions, because I'm sure there are questions about this. Um, who would like to start? Who would like to ask a question? What sort of applications are the people building in the workshop? Is it fairly small application? Or have you got it, yeah, it is fairly small, of course. So we, the workshops tend to be three hours. Um, we're doing a six-hour one actually this weekend at SPA, which should be interesting. Um, we've done them in as little as an hour and a half, but um, there's not a lot of time, and you're taking people who don't know each other. So it's uh, you know a new team, a new language. Often, most people don't know small talk. A uh, new environment, a new process. Um, so we started out. We've gone through a couple of tasks. I can't even remember what the first one was. It didn't work very well. So we switched to uh, people were writing a Sudoku solver, um, and then fairly recently we decided that that wasn't ideal because it was. Mm, the, the people didn't seem to come up with enough different ways of approaching the problem. There wasn't enough discussion. We wanted something that caused a little more heated debate. Um, so we've ended up flipping it on its head and we're get, having people write a Sudoku generator instead, um, which is a problem that people have thought about less and seems to be, seems to be working better. Um, but yeah, it's a, fairly, it's a fairly small thing, obviously. <laughs> the question being, obviously, does it scale to something larger? And, and yeah, I mean, we don't, I don't know the answer for that yet. We would, we would love to have a team who'd like to try this for a couple of weeks. So, uh, you know, if, if that's any of you, let me know. Um, I have no idea whether the thing scales in that way, but the ideas certainly seem to work on that scale anyway. Okay, uh, so the question is twin and triplet programming, uh, whether they're sitting together or, or apart. Um, it does seem like people tend to form the groups with the people they're sitting next to, um, and we certainly do see people getting up and walking around um, to sort of work together if they are sitting on opposite sides of the table. Um, We've had a number of cases where people do that, and then we point out, so in the environment, you can actually see um, when someone is editing a method, you can see it in your environment. It'll be changing as they're typing. Um, and there have been cases where people haven't realized that. And when we point it out, they kind of suddenly go, oh, OK. And they can go back, and they're not so concerned about it. Um, but the short answer is they do tend to go and sit physically together, um, whether that's necessary or just you know, more convenient since it's possible. I'm not sure. Um, how do you mean a physical constraint? Well, you've got one keyboard, possibly two No, no, you don't. So, that, so everybody, everybody has their own workstation. Oh, Everyone okay. has their own web browser. Um, and everybody, is, so everybody has exactly the same power and control in the yeah. environment. Yeah, no, and that is crucial. And that's, and that's the thing about pairing for me is that it, it is quite a physical. You are physically constrained by you can't really do three people in the traditional pairing sense. Um, obviously, physically, it just doesn't work. Yeah, I mean that, that basically, so the question is, have we considered extending it to have people co or not co-located uh, in different countries? Um, and that's basically the next um, experiment that we'd like to do. Um, different countries or different time zones, I think, is going to be quite challenging, obviously in the sense that the idea is you're doing it um, at the same time. So um, I suspect that if you're working in different countries, you probably end up having you know, maybe you end up having packs that are in the different time zones, and there's several packs, but they're not, I'm not sure. I don't quite know how that would work. Uh, different countries within, you know, at least roughly the same time zone uh, is definitely something that we want to try. 